right, everybody. Here we are in unit 11 of Foundations. And this is week 16, I think. And we are going to have our first of a couple integration weeks. And I'm really excited to see how this goes. Um, this is something that we did not do last year. So I just want to have full disclosure. We're in brand new territory this week. We did have big projects at the end, but after some discussion with our friends in Barcelona, Spain, they said that when they have long classes, sort of like our foundations class, they like to have integration weeks sprinkled through. And so here we are trying it out. We're gonna see how this goes. Um, we're gonna try and bring together some of the skills that we have done so far and get all of that to be up and running, something useful, and for each one of you to feel sort of the process of bringing those skills together. Um, these slides are going to be a little bit shorter, and hopefully our conversation afterward will be a little bit longer. Uh, we have our standard show and tell, which is always great to have. And then hopefully when we do that with each person, we'll get to chat a little bit about what you're thinking about for this week. And we can sort of in the moment, see if there's any hard course corrections. Like if, if someone um, wants to do something real crazy, things that would absolutely take longer than you expect. Like if you wanted to build a remote control car from scratch, uh, th that'll be the moment where we tell you, okay, pump the brakes, <laughs> let's, let's build the frame of the car or something like that so that it becomes approachable in a week. Um, but that said, we're gonna cycle back. There's gonna be several themes that you'll have seen again and they've been labeled with review content, so we know, but it's always good to remember some of these details as we're headed forward. So our game plan for the week is going to be to cover these things. And, and really it's all about integration, which is a skill that we absolutely wanna practice. The, one of the big themes of this entire course for all the foundations is that um, these skills are more than the sum of their parts, that when you have them together collectively, you can do more cool things than if you had just picked up one or two of the skills uh, independently. And so this is really a chance for us to bring those things together. And I want to say right now, there's no specific goal for how many of these skills get brought together this week, but we just want to have you feel, feel that experience of connecting the dots and bringing things closer. So we're going to talk about design goals and constraints and sort of procurement limitations. We'll talk about generating active, actionable ideas, which is circling back through brainstorming and design thinking, how iteration is always better. Some of these things you've seen before. And then the big, the big thing that I want to make sure that we focus on is integration purgatory, uh, or sometimes people call it integration hell, where you're building parts, you plan failures, you troubleshoot, and things get, that's where this week's experience is really going to be anything new, is in that place. And then some project suggestions for stuff that might happen by the end of the week. And so we have some ideas that could, could be helpful. So first up, if you're gonna do a big project and you wanna take something on or a week long project, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to think about and define are your design goals and constraints. And so with, with that, it's good to set yourself some pretty clear goals and you know, businesses or schools or whatever, they all like smart goals, right? Specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time-based because you're all adults that have had to deal with the workplace in one form or another. I'm sure you know what these are. Uh, they are cheesy or fantastic or whatever you think about them. That, I mean, you've got plenty of experience, but the key is that having a well-defined goal definitely still helps even within a makerspace. And so just knowing what you wanna make can really be a start. Um, in my life, I've definitely had times where I knew I needed to make a project. It needed to come quickly, but I, I had no idea what I wanted to do. and if I had a week timeline, it might take me until like Wednesday to know what I'm even trying to make. And if that's the case, then it's going to be really hard to produce by the time you get there. So setting up your goals early, really thinking about what you plan to do is a, is a great way to get started. And so hopefully by the time we leave tonight, you'll have something that you're thinking about uh, that's hopefully actionable or that you could at least research and verify, like, is this what I want to do? And so that's, that's sort of the goal. Um, and the big part of this is always time is our big factor because time goes quick. Um, with time, we've talked about this before. We, we have described this previously. We want to focus on supply side time management where you're in charge. So think about the time that you have this week um, because this week is different from other weeks. You know, you might have meetings on Wednesday or things going on later on in the week, or maybe you've got lots of extra time because it's still kind of a surge and you don't want to go out and see anybody, whatever the case may be. 
Um, think about how much time you have and then choose a project that fits that time frame. Don't choose something that's way too big for what you've got time for so that it doesn't like take, take the reins of the week and then have you feel frantic over, over this stuff that's, that's mostly supposed to be for fun. Um, and so the big thing is that you want to be in charge of this. And, and we've said that before. It's just good to say it again. Another thing that's really big to think about while we're talking about big projects is scope creep. So when you're choosing your project, you're going to need to make sure that you very carefully define it and don't let it keep growing. At least don't let it keep growing this week. You want to keep that very tightly under wraps. And, and as we're sort of in this review section, another thing to think about is does your project have a direct linear order? So if you're thinking about a project, does it have to be done one thing, then the next, then the next, then the next, and you don't get to vary? Is it all in series? Or can you do parts of it in parallel? Like, can you 3D print the housing while you're working on the electronics, right? Those sorts of things would be perfect if you could just set a machine to do some work for you while you go work on another thing while you're make heaven. That sort of closing the loop is really helpful to make these things feel productive, especially maybe you come in on Monday and you set a print up and you, you let it go, or you come in on, on Tuesday, you set a print, and then you come back on Thursday when I'm going to be there for office hours, we can work through the circuit and you've already got the housing like ready to go. So you can pop it into the place where it's going to live. Um, those sorts of pieces are really important. We've talked about it before, but if you can, if you're choosing between two projects and you know that one has parallel development, this is the week to choose the one that's got the, the parallel style. Uh, also start simple. Don't, don't start with a big complicated thing. We want to go with the simple stuff first and go through it that way. So we've talked about this before, how Legos were just bricks at the beginning. Then in the eighties, when they sort of moved to a lot more in America than they used to be prior to that, they got to these sort of simple designs. And now, now there's crazy things. Uh, you can, my, my family is, is all about these like crazy Lego designs. It's the holiday gift of the year this year. So, and then the last bit is to document as you go, especially when you're doing a project that feels unique and novel. And this is one that always gets forgotten for me. It's taken a lot of discipline to get better at this when I'm doing projects, to take a photo at the end, you know, take a picture of that beet pie that you made throughout the week, take a picture of the, the wood when it's cleaned, but not fully cut to shape, those sorts of things, get all those little details. Uh, and I've seen some of you be really good at this. Arvia is fantastic at documenting all of her stuff always getting pictures and videos and things. This is definitely something to keep remembering all the time. So that said, we've sort of, that's, that was all review. So we just sort of cranked through those things. Um, we still have a bit more of review, but here's, I think, really some important things that I want to lean into over on the left. Um, goals are the things that you really want your project to have, right? And so you want to make sure that those are the pieces that you define as well as possible. When you're thinking about this week, what is it you want to make, especially if it's something that's totally unique? And then constraints are what are your limits for the week? And time is going to be a big factor for everybody. And for what you're going to do this week, just do the first iteration. Do not try and have a finished product unless you know that it's going to be something that you can get done completely in a week or it doesn't have to be totally perfect for it to work. Um, those sorts of pieces, you want to give yourself the latitude for inside of one week let it be the first generation. And so, oh, and Steve's got a great point about documentation. It encourages you to slow down is a huge part of documenting is that you can go nice and slow. You can think about what you're up to and, and take that breath as it's printing. That's a great point. It would have um, helped me today when I was measuring twice and cutting once and still cutting wrong. Yeah. Yeah. The, I've so often gotten to a point where like I get to the end of a project or like the end of a day and I'm like, I need to go home. I've now got this like habit of if I have something that I need to cut, but I know I need to think about it more, I'll like put a tape measure up next to it and then snap a picture so that I can look at the measurements, have them take them home and like mull over it for a bit. <laughs> so I physically leave before I make any critical cuts. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, a big, I think a lot of people this week are just going to be building a proof of concept for what they're doing. The simplest version, the simplest check of an idea to see what you're up to, because we're going to have more of these integration weeks. It could be that you just keep building on what you're building now, 
uh, you could be working on what your final project would be, which is a long way away. We're talking about like June <laughs> for the final projects. But if you wanted to think about what those would be in the distant, distant future, this if you have that sort of a long-term plan, this could be your first little step on how do I make that part of it work? How do I get this next feature to, to fit in? And so this could just be the sanity check, the like proof to see if that happens um, and sort of move forward. But generating ideas is something that's complicated. Don't, ex don't put pressure on yourself to have some crazy big idea. Um, it's pretty well understood that when you apply pressure to be creative, usually people become less creative. And so don't, don't feel pressured to make something totally unique and mind blowing this week. You're just trying to get a project done inside of a week because that has just that skill has value. And so make sure that you're thinking about how do you integrate those things? How do you connect some of the skills that you've been using and sort of, I would say, search for projects that fit that? You don't want to necessarily be imagining something brand new because um, that can be a lot of pressure. If you feel up for it, you should absolutely go for it, but don't give yourself any sort of pressure to do that. And then another thing that's huge, especially when you've got one week to do it, is you, while I am talking right now, you could be sketching out, like, this is my thought. Here's what I think I want to do. Is this going to work? Just sort of working your way through those models and ideas. That's a great place to get started when you've got something like this that you need to make happen. Um, so running through those sketches, just getting something to be sensible. That's the hope that we can try and do because or that we can try and use for projects, because the more you can visualize it, the, the, the more you can think about it. I am particularly fond of 3D modeling. So for me, if I have a big project, I'll often hop into 3D design software because there I can sort of express my ideas about as quickly as I'm having them and I can get specific with it. That's not gonna be true for everybody. Fusion 360 is a giant behemoth. We know that, um, but a little bit of a sketch, something to get you going, that can totally be a great way to get started and just give yourself a check before you dive in full steam ahead for the week. So. That said, let's talk about iteration and how that fits in with what you want to do this week. These are, again, we're just still sort of doing that review, um, looking at what we've been up to, but iterating is definitely going to be a way to do things, to do things better. This is the, the story of these kids so that I had a few years ago where they needed to build an instrument. And so they started off with their boxy guitar and they worked their way through. All of this, so now you've got some CNC work behind you. These kids did their design and cutting on a CNC. So with that perspective, their first one was built all by hand. Then the, the next versions were all designed and cut on a CNC out of full sheets of plywood. So they had a whole host of steps that they needed to go through. These were 3D modeled and then cut, put together, assembled, glued, whatever it took to make them into reality. But it took one, two, three, four, four to five-ish different versions of this thing to bring it into something that was even reasonable for competition. And so this was over a period of two years. So do not in any way feel like you're going to make it through this iteration cycle inside of a week. What you want to do is just give yourself the latitude to think about you're building that boxy guitar and maybe moving on to this strange pear looking thing. So that, that would be your goal for this week. Um, if you wanted to make something and make it very nice, it's going to take those multiple passes. Um, any, anybody who's got a big project in the space, they've definitely done lots of, if you talk to any of the facilitators, their biggest projects, they definitely go through multiple times, multiple iterations and multiple ways to like check and see that they're doing things the right way. So don't try and give yourself the pressure to do it all at once. And I know I'm sort of belaboring that point, but it's, it's important as you get going. This first round, you're just trying to feel the integration trap of how that goes. If you've got this short time, the design cycle is still worth doing. Um, it's still something that you want to look at because it'll help you move through things. The first one that you want to do is come up with your question. Like, what is it that you want to do? What are your needs, the constraints, any information that you need to get to, to gather? Like maybe you need to find, if you want to build um, electronic dice, let's say if it, digital dice, you can totally do that, but you might need this week, this time around, because we haven't done our coding units yet. You might need code that someone else has written already. Um, there's a whole number of things that you might want to do. And so you might need to bring that information in so that you can come up with all the structure. 
then you're going to need to come up with new ideas. That's the sketching, the, the generating ideas, thinking about what you're, what you're up to, and then you'll do your building. And the building is really where you feel like you're going to, most people will feel a pressure to hop in and build right away. But oftentimes a well-planned build is a much better build. Um, I, I feel like I've never felt this more sharply than when doing home construction, like on the last, when, when I owned a house in Cleveland, I retrimmed every room in the house. And so by the time I got to the end, it was very clear after pulling off all the molding and cutting new and putting it up, that the more that I set up and prepped and got everything ready to go, the better it would go and the faster it would go. So it's not necessarily that you need to get in and get building, but having a solid plan, a good layout, a, a solid idea of what you're headed into, that can really help the build phase go a lot faster and feel like it stays more in the quarter range of the cycle than, than becoming three quarters of the cycle. So that build phase does is going to take some time. That's where you're going to spend a lot of energy this week, but you'll also not want to neglect the planning, questioning, and like getting ready. Then when we come back to show and tell after this week, then we're going to have a really interesting time evaluating. Uh, my thought is that we'll have a lot of people really feel the same sort of pressures from the week. But when you're, when you're doing this, the big thing is that you don't want to put too much value on your first attempt. Um, it might even, we, we might see that most of you want to practice the same thing again, a second time, or maybe you'll move on to something else since we're going to have more of these integration weeks, but doing this cycle just once gives you some value and feel, feel that process going through. What do you want? How are you going to do that? Then doing it and then evaluating what you did. The more that you want to build something or like these kids who built their, who built their guitar, they couldn't tell how well their idea was going to work until after they had built it. Right. So th in that case, it's a very clean border to that. They built this egg looking thing They were very excited about it, but apparently you need to have really good, uh, sealed walls and these extra long tines hanging off the top. They were not helpful for them, but they didn't know that until they, until they built it. Um, and so just running through the first time on a project, you're going to learn a lot more. You're going to feel a little bit better about going through it and you'd be better off for your next pass. Once you, once you've had this round go through once, if we're thinking about that in context of spiral development, the first pass is just giving you your minimum viable product this week. Um, you're not building the perfect footstool. You're building an existing footstool. Uh, something that's quick, that feels like you're integrating all the pieces. If you want a, you know, a stand for your TV to sit on, you want something that, that will hold the TV up. And if you want it to look nicer, maybe you want to add doors or drawers or any of that later. If you just want a TV stand, maybe it's sort of like an open shelf at this point, sort of an open boxy bookshelf. You don't need to have all the trim, the details, any of that figured out inside of a week. Just give yourself the minimum that it would take to get the, to get the week's work done. Um, and then when you go through, you'll sort of see what's better, what's, what's worse, how are you going to, how are you going to move those things around? How can you get there? Or maybe you just build a mock-up. Maybe you build a test, something that is going to be in the right direction. That's headed in the right, in the right path, but isn't giving you your, your overall finished product. You're just getting a much better sense of where you go for the next pass through. But now is really, this is where, this is where it gets interesting is once you have an idea you have a plan and you've got things that you're headed towards the big, the big thing is how do you integrate all of those pieces? So let's say you want to build something, uh, fascinating. You're going to need to put different pieces together, especially when we're asking you to build from different areas. If you've got electronics from like our Arduino introduction, you've got textiles and you've got woodworking, you're going to need to think of how do you connect those dots? Or maybe you want to build a, a bench with like a metal frame and a wooden top and then some upholstered pillows to go across the top of it. What are the things that you can do to make sure that that goes well? When you've got a big project like that, it can be really, really helpful if you've got pieces that you could put together and separately, they each kind of make sense, right? So in the case of building a bench where you've got just a, a metal frame, a wooden top, and then supporting pieces, it could make a lot of sense to, to build your pillows, right? And if this week, all you end up getting to because time runs out is building pillows, then, then at least you've got some nice pillows, right? You can have some cushions you could lay down on an existing surface. Um, and then 
if you, if time allows, you could build the sort of the base, the the wooden uh, seat. I'm imagining sort of a frame of metal and a wooden slab for the bench top. You could have that bench top and set it on milk crates or something. So you each piece you're building one at a time. Those supporting pieces can come in, and if you get to the next one, that's awesome. And if you can't get there, then you still have something that sort of works. And that modularity is a great plan for how to build a project. Um, those sorts of structures in how you build your design can be really helpful because it helps you be successful even if you haven't made it all the way to what you imagined as the end point. And to contrast, if you have a big project that needs all of those pieces to work in order for it to even turn on, now you've got a monolithic project that, that is either working or not together. And then it's tricky. It's hard to sometimes troubleshoot what's not working if it's all sort of there, but not functional. And the other piece is that if you don't have all the pieces in part, pieces and parts in place, then the whole thing may not work. And you'll feel, you won't feel that like in uh, little steps of success along the way. So having, having a project where you can find some level of testing, some level of progress is going to be important as you're making your selections this week. So try and look for things where you can do modular pieces, um, where you can try and have success as you go. And another thing, as you're working, and this is an important piece for integration projects, for the process of integrating, is having some planned failures, especially if you've got um, some of these things where you're, you've got a complicated project and it's got lots of different pieces. Um, I've definitely built things where I make assumptions about how they're going to work, like the Rube Goldberg contraption up here at the top. I've built things that feel like that, where I'm like, okay, this is going to work if step, if step F leads directly to G, leads directly to H, leads directly to I, and I'm sort of imagining this magical world where all the pieces fit together really nicely. And unless the bird catches the toast at, at step E, everything falls apart, right? So thinking about how you move forward in a project can be really important and checking to make sure that things are going to work is really important, especially if you're imagining sort of like, how is it going to break or how, or can you plan on how it's going to break? Like if you're trying to build um, a sign that you want to put, that you want to screen print something on, and then you want to sort of hang it as a big feature in a living room for a decoration, maybe you need to, and you're going to weight the bottom with a, a chain that you sew into the bottom of the fabric, right? So you've got a big panel you're gonna hang up on the wall and you wanna screen print something or like a pattern onto it with a series of screen prints and you wanna hang it from a wood piece at the top and something heavy at the bottom. Uh, you'll need to test to see is your fabric gonna be able to withstand the strength, right? Does your fabric tear? Or if you've got something that's electronics, right now in the space, I've got my light up jacket, the one that I had on screen last week. And will the batteries last? When I walked away, I left it turned on and I think the batteries are good for a day or two. And I, I don't know if they're still on. Uh, I'm gonna go back in tomorrow maybe and see if it's still operational. Do the batteries last long enough? Will the parts fit together? Uh, you know, does you have a square peg for a round hole? Do those, are those gonna work? Sometimes if you've got something that should work in some cases and not in others, if you've got something that's got lots of electronics or buttons or things, maybe it works in ways that you don't quite understand. And so for that, you've got to be extra careful. I've, there's definitely cases where you can, you can write your code just a little bit wrong. Um, or is it too complicated? How long will it last? Uh, how long are you building it for is a really key feature. Do you want it to be robust and everlasting and be very strong? That's an important feature. Or is it okay if, you, if it like falls apart in just a little while? So all of those different features you'll want to think about as you're planning out how the project's gonna work, you wanna see if it'll hold together and do all the stuff that you're hoping for and sort of probe at its edges. How much is it gonna break as you're doing it? And what are the places where you expect it to go wrong? Because if you have a sense for that, it can be very helpful. If, you're, if you have no idea when something goes sideways, it, you can be really, really stuck. Um, well, I mean, and we're here to support you, right? That's that's what Steve and I and many of the Make Haven members would be very happy to help anybody along with. But just understanding how things fail and how to improve them is a really important part of that skill of integrating things, of working through the integration trap. Another huge part, and it, it's hard to 
there's not a fantastic graphic for this, but troubleshooting is a skill all into its own. Just thinking about what's working and what requires fixing. It's a skill that requires patience, a lot of sort of grit to deal with the frustrations of things going wrong and understanding how it all interacts. I looked up Wikipedia's definition of troubleshooting and they call it a form of problem solving, often applied to repair failed products or processes on a machine. Um, it's a very long article if you're fascinated to read it, um, but basically troubleshooting is a systematic way of, of making fixes and changes. And my science teacher brain really wants to say this is the scientific process where you isolate a variable, do a test, and then you move on, right? So you, if you're talking about electronics, you ask questions like, is it powered? As it is the code that I think it uploaded, uploaded. Is it plugged in correctly? Are all the connections good? Those sorts of like one little piece at a time connections that you'll be troubleshooting, they can be applied to electronics. They can be applied to woodworking, to metalworking. All of those little features are things that you'll, that you'll need to think about. If you're trying to build that bench with a, a steel base, if your squares that you put on the end aren't really square, it's gonna to lead to a problem. And when you go to make your last welds, you might all of a sudden realize that something's, something's off. And then you'll have to figure out where is it off and how do you fix it through a process of troubleshooting. It's very different from in welding versus like electronics or woodworking, but in any case, you'll need to be able to spot the problem so that you can fix it. That's the center of what you're gonna to need to know. And for that reason, it's really hard to troubleshoot anything if you don't know how it works. I'm going to encourage everybody to try and go after instructions this week to follow them. But as you do that, you want to be really, really careful to think about the instructions and, and how understandable is it? What is it that you're going after? You want to choose something that feels like it's probably a little bit too easy for you so that all of these can be easily answered. Yes, I get it. Um, but you want to read the documentation of whatever you're working on, take notes as you're working, take pictures as you're working, um, if you've ever taken apart something complicated that you want to put back together, I take a lot of pictures during that process. And I would totally recommend that you do the same so that if you're in the midst of building something, the pictures you take are for documentation, but they're also so that you don't forget how it went together. Um, and so that's, that's really helpful in lots of ways, making lists. If you have complicated things, um, that you're putting together, like I've built RC cars, oddly enough, where there's lots of different cables and connections. And I would say the orange wire does this, the blue wire does that. And just sort of keep a list of what all the connections are that you're trying to make or the, the plans that you wanna make or a cut list for many woodworkers will keep a cut list for themselves of this is what I wanna cut, here's how it's gonna get attached and sort of organize the parts of your design in that way. Making lists like that can be really, really helpful to keep yourself organized. Um, and then troubleshooting, definitely just do one variable at a time. It can be tempting to go faster by trying to test multiple things at once. Um, I see high schoolers do it all the time, but the key is to make sure that you're isolating out the sources of problems and their solutions so that you know how to fix the problems that you get. And then the last one is don't ever forget the obvious stuff. Is it plugged in? Um, did you turn it on? The, is the, you know, the, the pieces that you're looking for that of course you checked it, right? Those, those always get me and I always get them much later than I think I should. So be careful and give yourself the latitude to check that sort of stuff also. So those, those are the general pieces of advice. Uh, and now we're gonna try and apply it to some examples. So I've got a few things that I picked that I think would be really fun if you wanted to try these. They have a little, you know, they're, they're not necessarily what you're gonna choose. But in general, here's, here's a few. And so these are some classic ones with some electronics. So if you're interested in this, you want to try this out. This is a useless box up here in the top left. And if you've never seen one of these, you're going to love it. Uh, what, oh boy, but I need to make sure that I hit play the right way. So this is a short video. You just click the little switch and then the box turns it off. And that's it. That's the whole useless box. It's delightful, it's hilarious, it's a fun little trick. You can do it totally with an Arduino. So if you wanted to practice your Arduino skills, this is exactly the example that we were looking at. You'll notice it's got a laser cut enclosure, which is really fun. Um, and so you can build it just like these instructions have you do. 
This is a great example for an integration project because it's got Arduino, it's got electronics, it's got laser cutting, it's got like the woodworking assembly piece of it, right? All of those little features fit together to make this a really good integration project. So if you wanted to do this, this is a really fun one to give to kids or people or you know anybody who's would be amused by this sort of a thing. Um, there's other examples. The Arduino version is gonna slowly drain batteries over time. If you're feeling adventurous, the analog version is just as fun. This is the same sort of a deal and we can mute this one, um, but it's completely handled by circuits and switches. So if you feel like buying a lot of really elaborate switches, you can build basically the same thing, uh, but no Arduino and no code involved. You're just building the circuit and it works in a really predictable way. So it's, it's lots of fun. Um, you can see these are all of the components. So it's a couple of switches, the a geared motor like this and a battery pack. And basically, unless it's moving, it's not draining the battery. So the battery will last on this for a very long time if you build it this way which is lots of fun. And these components, we could uh, we have them all in the back. We can dig them out of a bin, maybe not the motor, but I can help you get any of those if you want. Then it's the same laser cutting and, and wood gluing together. It's a, it's a fun project. It's a great example. If everybody built one of these, uh, I would be delighted, right? Like it's, it's lots of fun. Um, another great example is this, whoops, come back over here. This one, which is digital dice where this is definitely going to require some sort of an Arduino, but in here you've got a, a little bit of a system and you just press the button and the person's going to get to it eventually. You press the button and it, it just gives you a number, right? It's got the six LEDs that represent the six colors of the dice and you can, you can do it that way. If you're a big D&D &D player and, and uh, you know, we're thinking about a few members of this class, then maybe you want to have more than six seven, six or seven pieces on your, on your die. And so from those seven dots, you could get your six. If you go up in numbers, you can get a 20 sided die or whatever you need to have. You can even do them with digital displays. And this is just one example and there's the link for it, but the digital dice, if you Google this on Instructables, and if you haven't been to Instructables, this is a great part of the internet. Um, these are all instructions on how to do basically the same thing. Here it is with um, number displays. Here it is with just a breadboard. Here it is with some strange uh, treat for a box. Here's like a little display with maybe a digital diagram, you know, like a drawing of an LED or drawing of a, of a dice. There's tons of ways that you can make these. And, and then Instructables really goes all sorts of sideways with all the things you want to do. But you can totally look up just projects in general on here. You can cover it with circuits. You can do all categories. Instructables is a great spot for you to get inspired this week if you wanted to do any of these sorts of things. Um, wooden marble run, that's a lot of fun. That would be a great one. A bird feeder, little baby jellyfish. Those are adorable. Uh, Instructables in general lives, here's a, a rice cooker pancake. That sounds lovely. Uh, it, this covers the whole range of things that you might want to learn and generally pretty good instructions. These can be written and submitted by anybody. So it, it's not like it's necessarily going to be a ton of fantastic instructions, but they can also be submitted by some people who really put a lot of energy in how to do these things. Here's a flux capacitor PCB badge if you want to do that or embroidery using only one stitch, a blanket stitch. There's all sorts of cool things and that really looked great over here. Um, there's all sorts of things that you can do and you can learn and you can make from Instructables. So if you're trying to get inspired this week, you can totally do some stuff here, look through this and you, you, can, you can make some really cool stuff just following these instructions. Um, but I have a few more. Here's reupholstering a chair. Felt like it would be a good category of things for people to do this week. This would be very hands-on, very, very do-it-yourself. Um, and there's tons of people who make good videos on how to do this also, especially these dining chairs where you just have like a padded bottom and it's not the whole thing is upholstered. This is a pretty approachable project. You take those bottoms off. You can either take off the fabric that's there if the cushion's really shot, or you can just cover them with fabric. Usually you just need a staple gun to make this work and a few screwdrivers, but it can really class up a set of chairs. Here's the one with a neat coffee bag. That seems neat. Um, 
uh, here's a really good project from DIY creators. And this guy's fantastic. You can see his background there he built. This is an entire tutorial video on how to build those backdrops, how to put in the LEDs, how to make your Zoom room look, look nice. Um, my living room is definitely a representation of this meme up here at the top where you got one nice little corner and then everything else is a mess sometimes. But uh, thinking about how you'd wanna build something like that could, could be a great project for the week. And they go together pretty quickly. It's big. Um, but it's impactful. And if you spend, if you still spend a lot of time on Zoom, it could be a fun way to add some pizzazz to your background if you've ever got big meetings that you need to be ready for. Um, and then you can, you could also do literally anything else. So there's no, there's no requirement, no specific thing. When we say it's an integration project and we're on week uh, 16, yeah, on week, that does not mean that there's 15 things that have to be integrated. Instead, just one or two, you know, try a couple things. If you can hit three or four, you're really knocking it out of the park. We just want you to try and do some different features of what we've been up to and integrate them together, going from idea to product inside of a week. Just that alone is going to give you enough of a struggle that it's, it's going to be fine. Um, but definitely, definitely, definitely for this first round, there's two, you're going to hit your cognitive load for the week because you're also busy people with other things to do. So don't try and imagine something carte blanche unless you're really into it um, and have the time. What you wanna do is follow some instructions and sort of make those connections as you go. You'll have plenty of creativity within that space, but putting guardrails on that for yourself is gonna be very helpful. Um, but with that, it'd be cool if we had all sorts of, you know, a bunch of diversity in what people make because it'll be really cool to see. Don't don't try and check all the boxes. Do not try and be the, the thing that we're the most proud of at the end. What you want to do is just make something that you want in the time you've got to work. Don't try and overdo it. That is going to be hard enough just to make the thing that you want and to make it happen inside of a week. I promise you I've done lots of these like sprints where you try and be creative and build something all inside of a short time frame. And any sort of a sprint project like this is going to be hard enough on its own just because there's limitations. Uh, you've got to think about how, where are you going to get your materials? Where's the stuff going to come from? There's, there's going to be lots of different hiccups that will make it harder than you think for just a week. Like getting your materials alone could be tricky. Maybe you've got something that you have to order from Amazon. You don't know if we have it at Make Haven and you should definitely ask because we have a lot of weird electronics in the back. Um, wh where are you going to get the stuff from? Does it take four days to come in? And then you're stuck with just three days left in a week. Uh, how does that work out? Then if you're coding, if you're using code that you didn't write and you copy paste it in, it can be really hard to troubleshoot what's not working. Again, we're here to help you with that. There's, there's electronics facilitators. I can help. Um, uh, we can help each other. There's tons of ways that we can get better with that. And you're going to get better at code as we move through the next couple of weeks, which are the coding units. But um, for right now, it can be sort of a mystery if you have a code problem and you're not sure where it came from. So those things can be tricky. Troubleshooting electronics. If you're building something on a breadboard, breadboards are fantastic, but they also are a little spotty. Um, if you get stuck on a breadboard, here's, I'm gonna just pull this up, Tinkercad. Tinkercad is a great way to, to test something. And so let me do, 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 do. Tinkercad, sign in with Google. Tinkercad is fantastic because you can fully and totally, in addition to 3D designing things, you can also simulate circuits. And so here are some circuits that I have designed. And when you're doing this, if you've got a circuit like this one that you're playing with, you can simulate it, you can build it here, you can do everything on a breadboard and you don't have to worry about the connections being slightly loose, right? This is gonna get built and it'll just sort of work. I, I, this is a crazy model. I think I was just drawing things, not even writing code to go with it. But in here, if you have all these connections made, you'll be able to test and see how it works without any worry about is, is it that the things are half broken? Like you can isolate a little bit more easily. Is it supposed to work if I didn't have all the things, you know, if I hadn't blown out the LEDs, you don't want to be grabbing from a bag of like the LEDs that were supposed to be thrown away. And then you're using those. And then you're really frustrated for no reason. If you simulate everything in Tinkercad, you can, you can check it in code and see this one might do something. Yeah. Uh, you can check it in code and see if it's going to work. Is it going to show you what you think you're going to see? And the simulation, will it, will it work out like you're hoping? Um, so 
in this system, you can do some checks that way, but it can be really helpful if you've got a complicated circuit that you want to test. You can do it without needing to buy anything. You can you can check it out this way. Um, and the the biggest hiccup that I think most people are going to struggle with is you're going to run out of time is basically what it'll be. You have this big plan for a project and you want to do a thing and then time runs out. This happens no matter what your time scale is, no matter what your project is, it doesn't matter. Time is always fleeting. Um, I'm a teacher. So the summers are a, a magical time for me to get lots of things done that I want to do for me, but they always go too fast. Um, whether I'm writing lesson plans or building another bar bot or whatever it is, the, the time is always going to run out. And so this little week is just a microcosm of making that happen. So don't put too much pressure on yourself. It's going to happen. These are hiccups that could definitely occur. Um, two, two of them are electronics based. So if you want to avoid electronics because you feel like it'll be less mysterious when you have mistakes, that's totally understandable. Um, but there's a whole number of ways that you can be successful. And so just plan it's good to think ahead of what your hiccups could be. What are the things that could get you? And so here's what are, what are the things that are next? These are the pieces that we want to suggest to get going. But the big one is that choose something that you think is too easy. Something that you think is not going to be beneath you. And it's not what you're, you, at the end of the week, you may or may not be proud of it. It's going to be hard enough because it's a week. So that said, steps that you want to go after. First step is make a plan for what you want to do. Think about what could you get in time, then think about what you want to do, not necessarily what you want to do first, because there's things you may want to do that if you just can't, if it says it's got four weeks of shipping, you're not going to be able to do it. So think about what it is that you can get access to and that you want to do. What are the areas that you could integrate in the project? And don't sell yourself short. I was talking with somebody yesterday or two days ago, and we were talking about um, 3D modeling and then cutting something out on the laser cutter and then gluing it together, all made out of wood. Just, just by virtue of 3D modeling and then exporting a DXF and cutting it on the laser and gluing, boom, 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 you're in three different sections, 3D design, laser cut, and woodworking, all inside of just that one idea. And, the, and they were worried it wasn't going to cover enough. So what do you want to integrate? And, and you might have more integration in it than you think you do at the start. So give yourself the latitude to go slowly and think about those pieces. Um, also make some sense about what's the minimum viable product that you're going to be happy with. And don't shoot for perfection. Um, people who shoot for perfect, I have said for a long time, perfection is a disease. It's not a thing that's real. So you want to choose something that you're happy with and then, and then know what you're going for. Um, I mean, when you're trying to bring a product to market. You want it to be perfect, but in prototyping, that's, that's usually not true. What are the constraints that you're playing with? So that's a big, important piece while you're planning. It's thinking about what is it that you want to get done? What is it you're going for? And what is it, what are your limits? Um, and time is one, but money is probably another one. There's all those different factors that you'll want to think about um, for, for what's going on. Maybe electronics is a constraint if you don't feel confident in that area, or maybe sewing is a constraint if you really are still sort of just getting started with the sewing machine. There's a whole range of things that you could be thinking about as constraints and goals. And so make sure that you're clear about what those are. Then step two would be to get started. And so run your sanity check. If you've got a breadboard or if you wanna, if you're building a piece of furniture, can you build it out of cardboard just to see if it's gonna work? If you set a can of pop or soda or whatever you call it in New England, uh, if, you, if you can put a can of soda on it, does it hold up, right? Is it strong enough that it won't fall over just out of cardboard um, for that mock-up or model? If you're building something complicated, you might need to build a jig and that could be a first step. So if you, if you need to hold something in place or if you wanna CNC a series of things, you may want to build a jig that you clamp to the CNC and then clamp work pieces inside of that. There's a whole range of things that you might need to do to get ready to even produce what you're going for. Um, or maybe if you've got a, a long series of glue ups, if you're trying to do something very complicated in woodworking, you might need to do the first couple glue ups and sort of get yourself started and on the way. So you even have the right sort of stock material to go with. Um, a, a big thing, and this is a huge piece, um, is that you want to definitely just get started in addition to planning. And I have talked about the value of planning. Another thing is that you can definitely over plan. 
So you want to get started at some point, if we get to like Thursday and you haven't actually put the rubber to the road yet, that's the moment where you're like, what, I just need to start. Um, and so at some point you're going to need to get things underway. You're going to need to get things going. You're going to need to cut the wood. You'll need to start welding. You'll need to, whatever it is you'll want to get started so that you have something because you'll learn more as you're in process, right? As you're working on it, you're going to learn more because you're bringing it closer to reality. You'll be able to think about it more, add more details and make those improvements. And if possible, make it through the design spiral again. Um, that, there's not a lot of pressure to do that. Multiple design cycle passes, but generally the earlier you can get physically doing, the earlier and more times you can go through that design spiral. And then definitely document as you go, for sure. Um, the integration purgatory is definitely a step that you're going to have. This is where it's the short, it's the short part of this list, um, but it may be a big part of where you spend your time. Once you're halfway through, thinking about how do I get these pieces to fit together, right? I've cut the legs to my table and the top of my table, but they don't fit is an important thing to think about when you're doing your integration work. How do you, how do you make changes? Do you need to make your legs smaller? Do you need to somehow make your table bigger? Those sorts of pieces you'll have to think about as you're getting through. And you won't even know that you're gonna have those problems until you're part way in. So integration purgatory is going to be a piece of what you're up to this week. And you'll definitely wanna think about it. If you haven't, I'll post a link in the chat and foundations about the YouTube channel stuff made here. He very vocally talks about his integration hell is what he calls it, where he gets stuck and he's working. And then he's in this loop for days where he's just can't move forward because there's something stuck in the code. Um, it's a YouTuber that made a, a, you know, rocket powered baseball bat and all sorts of different crazy contraptions. So there's tons of different ways that you might build things, but seeing about how you, you move through that, how you troubleshoot and move forward is really important. And then the fourth step is celebrate completion. Woohoo! That's the one where we hope everybody gets. Uh, and so having something by the end of the week can be really nice. It'll be really fun if people have cool things for next week's show and tell. It'll also be really fun if people have things that are like glorious, magical failures. And I, I want to be very, very clear that some of the best things that you learn come from projects that don't end the way that you want. There's definitely things that I have built that have failed fantastically. Um, there's at some point I tried to make a, a suit where the lapel and I needed to get a photo of it, but a suit where the lapels light up and I had 3d printed these things. I had LEDs underneath one of each one of the lapel like segments and it was looking really great. I had done a really nice job making it look nice. It was supposed to be a suit jacket that could light up like red, white, and blue, or it could be whatever color for whatever holiday it was. Um, but then I plugged it in and I turned it on and it let out a puff of smoke and that was it, right? So you can have glorious failures that also teach you a lot. And that's going to be a big part of what this week's experience is going to be. So do not feel disheartened if by the time we get to the end, you're not celebrating completion, you're celebrating a failure. And that celebrating a failure is a critical part of how we want to work on these things. I mean, I, if we go back through and look at all these examples, Coming back to this, many of these did not work. This egg thing in the middle that the girl is smiling about, absolute object failure. And it's totally fine. Those are going to happen on the way to getting somewhere where you want to go. When you're, when you're building things, you're going to have ideas that don't work well. You're going to have projects that just fall apart. I've tried many times to make engravings like this little girl's face, and it has never worked. You're going to have failures that happen. You're going to hook up your LEDs backwards. Your 3D prints are going to fall off the printer bed. All of that is going to be a big part of how this week works. And those things are just as much something to celebrate because you get negative feedback. And in that negative feedback, which sounds inherently bad by the name because it says negative in it, that's the way that you get corrective action. If all you do is win, 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 no matter what, then you never actually learn anything that's useful in helping you get better. And so for that, what you really want to do is take your steps forward, troubleshoot your way pro through projects, move towards these things that you set out as goals for yourself, but don't put a ton of pressure if the useless box doesn't work. If you flip the switch and nothing happens, it's totally fine. For a nice, simple project, we can usually bring it 
to completion with a little bit of help and guidance. But either way, the goal of this week is, is to have something for show and tell next week, but it's not necessarily that you're going to have something that's totally complete and working. It's that you have an experience that you've moved through over the course of the week through which you're going to have learned about the integration process and how you bring these skills together. Yeah. So that is the core goal is to try and bring some skills together to make something that's interesting. Hopefully it can be creative, but if not, follow some instructions and you're going to learn more about how to, how to get one step closer to a box that just shuts itself off. Um, and that's, that's going to be great. You're going to really enjoy it. It'll be weird and a full drama, I promise, but we'll get there. So that is the end of the slides. And I'm going to stop sharing. Um, we, that, was, that was maybe about as long as normal. I can, I can go for a long time about ideas and how they work and how they sometimes don't work out the way you want. But I hope this week you've got some ideas about cool things that you want to do and some stories about what happened this past week. So uh, now it's time for show and tell and a little bit of conversation about what, what you are thinking about what you wanna do. Because the transition, it might be nice to separate those, but because the transition on Zoom takes a second, we'll instead just have each person talk about like, what did you do this week? And then what are you thinking you might try and do this next week? And if what you say today is 0% what happens when we come back around next week in 168 hours, 167 hours, there is no problem with that. You can do whatever you want with those hours and make whatever you feel like. And if it makes three big U-turns, that whatever number of U-turns, that's totally fine. So uh, Renee just turned on your camera. Do you want to tell us what you have been up to and if you have any ideas about what you're going to do this week? Sure. Um, so I will share my screen really quick. Oh, it says um, oh. screen share is disabled. I think I just turned it on. Um, so I just have a little bit of process to show. This week was definitely like it's not perfect, but it's a thing that I did. Um, so like my sewing here was so sloppy because the thread just kept coming like out of my needle and it wouldn't stay knotted and the needle was too big for the loops. And so like sewing the back of this was um, kind of a nightmare. Um, but the Sorry. circuit did work. So I was really excited about that. So when it turned on at the end of it, I was like, okay, like it worked. So I did that part, right. Just, you know, had to troubleshoot, you know, some of the other stuff. Um, and I just did like a very, very simple punch needle embroidery. So this is not anything like like I did this super quick, just sketched it out really fast. And um, you can even see some of the marker, oh, whoops. You can see some of the marker left over that hadn't like disappeared yet um, from a part that I didn't, uh, didn't end up embroidering because it's, um, it's a marker that like disappears over time mm. um, for use and things like this. But um, yeah, I made some little, like flower lamp looking things. And while it is really simple, I was kind of just proud of myself for like getting through the project because I've been super low energy lately and everything has kind of been a struggle. Um, so yeah. I'm I was going to say it looks great. <laughs> I, I mean, I think for you, it feels like a simple thing, but I was like, you nailed it on the two layers. You got a design that you put through. Uh, you did the punch. It was awesome. Oh yeah, I forgot to talk about the two layers of mm -hmm. fabric. Um, that was important. So you have like one layer in the front where you do the embroidery and then a second layer in the back where you actually sew through and do the circuit. Um, but yeah. 
it'd be, I think it'd be really fun to do again with something more intricate, but mm -hmm. getting the basics down this time was, was nice. Yeah. I, I feel like your, your design mind is going to do a really good job of like, you have one day you'll have a perfect idea of like, I want to make this embroidery hoop of something that'll go on the wall that'll, that it needs light. Right. And like, you'll have this moment where you'll realize this is what I want to design. And then it'll be perfect. Cause you have this skill in your toolkit. Yeah. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that existing Renee. <laughs> yeah, me, me too. <laughs> yeah. You're going to, you're going to do great. Awesome. Oh, and before, before you go, do you have any ideas for what you think you might want to oh. do this week? Um, not yet. I'm still noodling on it. Um, get right. to brainstorm a little bit more. Totally reasonable. Uh, I would definitely recommend scrolling through Instructables or Etsy and see if there's things that you like, just love and want to recreate. That's, okay. that's a great winning strategy. All right, Lisa, you also have your camera on. If you want to be next up. And then those of you... We've got Arvia, James, and Norm. If you're around nearby, we'd love to, when, when it's time to get you in. Okay, so um, I, I, for the uh, wearable, I'll put it on in a second. I made a, I got a ski headband and I um, did the wiring from behind. I did a, I did a sketch first because for me, it was hard to conceive of, well, there's a top and there's an underside and they both have to relate, you know, where the minus is, where the plus is and they can't crisscross. And um, <clears throat> I don't know if my components look like everybody else's because I saw in Renee's, uh, this thing here, I guess where it holds her battery looks different than mine. Yeah. I don't know. So did, did hers have a switch in it? Hers, hers did. Remember, you got yours the day before they were delivered, right? And so you, you had a slightly different setup, but you yes. solved it with a, a snap, right? Yeah, I did. But because there was no diagram showing where the snap went and how that worked, it really took a little bit. And uh, my son kind of helped me think through where it needed to go. And and I didn't want to do this kind of thing where you're trying to scrum scrunch things together. So. I made, I sewed a tab on and it reaches over to where the snap goes and then everything lights up. So I'll put it on and show you what happens. I'll turn off the lights. So I, I put these the flowers <laughs> on there so that it would diffuse it. <laughs> That's so go. nice. <laughs> I, I feel like... <laughs> It's incredible. That's like a magical little headband. You're ready for night skiing. Exactly. I, I can be seen. I can't see, but I can be seen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if I had a dog and I took it out for a walk, which I don't, I'd be safe, right? <laughs> yeah. Or like, um, I don't know, Cleveland had ice festivals and things to do in the winter. That would be like a great going out for a winter festival, yeah. like just to, you know, to add a little excitement to it. Yeah. And be warm at the same time. Yeah. So that was a like a really fun project for me, and um, you know it kind of grew as I'd said. Well, now I have the LEDs on there, but they're kind of ugly. What can I do to to soften them up some? So, and um, the thing is, is since I have this tab here that has a snap, every now and then it flops over, and then it mistakenly turns this on. So I said, okay, I need a way to tuck it in when I don't want it to be on. So then I, you know, added this little, a little thing that cat catches it. So it stays away. So Make, makes total sense. That's great. That was that. that. That's awesome. And then do you have any plan for what you want to try and do this week? Well, you know, I guess it's going to evolve. I, I do want to look on instructables because my preconceived notions, I'll just tell you the list I wrote and uh, I don't know if it even fits in, but the first one was really to take that big cutting board that I have and begin to think about how to, you know, carve into it the, the depressions that I want to go in there, the well entry and all of that by building a, maybe a, um, a plywood replica of it. So I'm not mm -hmm. messing with the real thing. So that makes make, sense. 
make some layered plywood like you know like that um cello shaped guitar had several layers mm -hmm. and uh, you know mess around with that and see what's the best way to go about things i've also done that with two by fours before because they're okay. so cheap and you okay. square off the two by fours and yeah. you're basically making the world's worst cutting board sure but it, but it machines really nicely Okay. And is a great way to test and see, like, is it going to give you what you want? And do you glue them together side to side? So, yep, so. totally. Okay. Just use the table saw, take off all the round edges, square uh -huh. them up with a planer. And, okay. and then you can, you'll just have like a, a block of pine. And then okay. pine is way softer. So it's going to be much easier to machine. Great. I mean, so that, I mean, that's what I really want to be doing. But I, first of all, didn't know if that falls into the category of, uh, you know, crossing whatever, multi integrating anything. I mean, I mean it'd be woodworking and a little bit of design, maybe even 3D design if you're really yeah. thinking about sort of the depression depths and then CNC. I mean, that yeah, feels like it hits three. So, so I mean, that was the one I really wanted to do. But if that didn't seem right, um, at least at some point in this life, I want to uh, make a table to hold my electric piano. Uh, and maybe laser etch a design in there. So, you know, that's another sort of thing where maybe I do a cardboard version now to kind of begin to figure it out. Uh, is that, and the third idea was laser etch some denim fabric and then sew something with it. <laughs> oh yeah. Just something I'd like to do sometime too. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and the facilitator Lila did a, she like did a deep dive into laser engraving denim and so she's got some thoughts if you wanted to talk with her about that or like how you do it okay or or if you you know depending on your denim source if you wanted to make like a, a bag to hold something out of denim because it's such a strong material maybe you want right. to have it to to hold to hold the cutting board to keep yeah. it safe when you're not when you're not using it yeah um no i could ask her about that but i, I am gonna have to make a decision <laughs> and uh... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. At some at some point, you gotta you gotta choose and and move forward. Yeah. Uh, does Make Haven have those two by fours, or do I have to go to like Home Depot and get it? It would be a Home Depot or a Lowe's run. Um, okay. The good news is, like per board, you're talking. Well, pre pandemic, it was like a dollar fifty a board. Yeah. Now it, it's. I mean, it still can't be five dollars a board, and pretty probably accurate. two would do you. And they're long, so I yeah. Um, and but they might be also be bowed or you know twisted, right? It's true, but if you're going to cut them up first, that mm -hmm. takes you know if they're very bowed over a length, mm -hmm. when you cut them up into 15 inch sections, that 15 inch section isn't going to be very bowed. Good. So you cut them up into the shortest length that you need. And then they're already a lot straighter. And then if you need to joint them or plane them, it'll it'll work nicely. Okay. All right. Um, I might opt to, to try to go down that route just because okay. I, yeah. All right. Sounds I'm, good. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yep. That's it. All right, James, you are the next one to turn on your camera. All right. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, so... In the last two days, I completed three projects, uh, actually four. Um, so from oldest to most recent, I finished uh, 3D designing and then 3D printed this kind of like modular stamp. So this is like a little handle and then there's a plate that dovetails in there, um, which is pretty cool. And it was really fun as a design project, but it's a terrible stamp. So don't 3D print a stamp. Um, and apparently this space has rubber so that you can laser etch it instead because that works way better. Um, but it was fun to do, so I did it. And then I also um, made this sign for my cat, which is his name, Rug, uh, <laughs> to put above his food bowl using the V bit. Uh, and then I made a little light up embroidered constellation uh, you can see my embroidered handwriting is as bad as my in real life handwriting. Um, and I actually also kind of interestingly 
just use regular LEDs uh, as opposed to the stitch on LEDs. I just poked them right through the fabric and kind of bent them and so on. Um, this was really frustrating <laughs> because it was a lot of, it made me feel like my hands were like huge <laughs> and I couldn't see anything, but it was a lot of fun to do. Um, so yeah, I also completely unrelated carved this spoon, which is like a serving spoon and it should be like this much longer, but I messed up. So it's a very short serving spoon, but that's what I did this week. And I think I want to try to 3D design a kind of complicated thing that I can either laser cut or CNC and assemble. What that thing will be, I don't know. Um, but now that I'm thinking about electronics, I'm like, hmm, maybe I should add an electronic in there, right? So yeah. who knows? <laughs> Choose, choose something that you think is simpler than you need. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> don't, like, hmm, don't, how do they overcomplicate this? <laughs> yeah, don't try that. That's like if you're done on Friday and you're like, I still have time and right. keep going. <laughs> right. So yeah. who knows? I'm, I'm probably going to look at Instructables a bunch tomorrow, um, like procrastinating from work and like kind of just get an idea and do it. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Makes, cool. That makes sense. Awesome. Arvia, next up. Hey, y'all. Um, I also finished up a bunch of projects this week. Let me share my screen. Um, so the first thing is, okay, share screen. Y'all see my screen? Yep, it's coming. Um, so the first thing is this sign, well, Dylan's sign in the background, which I think I showed y'all last week. Um, so I finished it up, uh, sealed it with some rub on polyurethane um, and filled the uh, engraving from the CNC machine with um, some off-white, uh, I think it's probably your thing too, <laughs> but plastic. Um, that was a really cool process. It has some air bubbles in it. It's not perfect, but I think it came out really, really great. And my nephew better like it and have it forever. Um, I mean, from the photo, it's a, I saw it in real life and I, I'm seeing the photo now. Like the photo makes it look perfect. In real life, the flaws that you're talking about are like, they're very, very tiny things. Yeah, <laughs> they are. They are. It's really, really nice. So I'm really um excited about that. Um, the other thing is this. Now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because I have it in my house. I'll share, but how do I stop my share? Stop share. Okay. Okay. So the other thing was that um mouth spinning thing that you saw. It was spray painted in gold, the non-spinning part, but. Once I put the polyurethane on, the gold, the like metallic gold got really dull and I didn't like it anymore. Um, so I came home here and I, it's like a stand for my records. So I filled it in with white. Um, I might go over it in black. I don't know. I'm not sure how I'm feeling about the white letters either, but either way, you can actually see the now spinning. Um, I really love that. I'm going to put it on the wall. Corey did my keyholes because that was, a much harder thing than I was even anticipating in my head. I was like, oh, it's probably just a drill bit that you just, <laughs> it was an easy process. But when Corey showed me yesterday, I was like, oh yeah, no, let's, let's not. Um, and so he did, um, and Corey did it for me. Um, yeah. And I also 3D, 3D printed, I did not design these, I found them on Thingiverse, these um, eyeglass holders. I have so many pairs of glasses and sunglasses just all over my room. So I uh, printed this stand, this one stands up by itself, and then one to go on the wall, just because I wanted to see how this one would work. I'll probably um, print a couple more of one of the versions. And uh, yeah, I think those are the things I did this week. Um, I didn't get to the, the, uh, the textiles um, yet, but I also want to do the, um, the Scorpius a uh, constellation on the embroider hoop. So hopefully I'll get to that at some point soon. Um, for integration, 
I'm also deciding like everyone else. Uh, <laughs> I was telling Corey yesterday, it's a bit between doing something cool, that's fun, and like doing something for my house that I really didn't need to do anyways. So um, I'm actually gonna, I had drew this like little sketch of a TV stand. Sorry about that. A TV stand that I'm gonna like upgrade basically. I don't know if y'all can see this, but oh. um, so, I'm not building this. I already decided I'm, I don't feel like it. Maybe I'll do it at the end of this, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not. So I'm going to get the frame probably like from Ikea or somewhere and like upgraded, if that makes sense. Um, and I want to put doors on it. And at first I was just going to do the fluted doors. But I think I'm going to design doors on the CNC um, with like some carving in it maybe. Um, and stain it or something. I don't know, I'm gonna put the handles on. So that was one of the projects I was thinking. Um, I also wanna try like uh, laser engraving, la laser engraving with some some cloth. Um, I watched something last night and they started talking about the clothes falling apart. So I was like, all right. <laughs> yeah, uh, you gotta be careful. It's like just getting the settings dialed in if you wanna laser engrave on cloth. Right. Um, and then the other thing was, wait, I wrote this down, a clock, I was thinking, like a wooden clock, like maybe um, mm -hmm. designing the frame on the CNC or just building it by hand or something and um, doing the electronics uh, behind it. Yeah. Oh, and for the yeah, door, there's... sorry. No, go ahead. As I say, for the door, I wanted to put like a magnet to make lights come on. Like, I don't know if there's a way to do a magnet when they close and then a light, or when it opens, the light comes on, I don't know. Yeah, you've got a treasure trove of good ideas. Um, the clock sounds super doable. I, I've seen, and actually in Makehaven, there's a really cool clock that I think Lior made that is a bunch of wood pieces that are just glued up onto the wall or screwed onto the wall. And you can make some really nice looking clocks that are just huge. The thing that would, they would cost giant amounts of money to buy from a store. Um, the type of switch that you're looking for for your doors is a reed switch. And we can absolutely get one of those. And I can ask, I'll put it in a chat somewhere. But a reed switch is like a magnetically activated switch so that you can get them so that either when the magnets nearby they're off or when the magnet is nearby they're on and then you just hook your light in through that and and that's plenty so you can totally do that there's even like if you're trying to build it into a closet door they even have um they have like door frame buttons so that when the door is open it like unpresses a button and it knows to turn the door on, to, to turn the light on and inside of a real closet, I've gotten away with like a motion sensor. So when you open the door, it sees the motion of you being there and that's enough to get it to work too. So there's a, there's a lot of ways that you can get that to work. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'm not going to do all of that. Really just one piece of one of those projects. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pick one piece of one of them. The, I mean, the clock sounds like lots of fun because it could be structural, huge. There's a ton of design that would go into it. You know, you might put stickers up for 12 or something, stickers up for numbers, put um, the mechanism in something. There's there's a lot that you could get to with, with all those pieces. Steve, it seems like you might have some ideas about some of these projects. You unmuted yeah, for a bit. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's super exciting stuff. Um, and also inspiring me uh, as, you know, the, the thought of the read switch. I'm, I'm slowly planning out some built-in furniture um gosh where to start uh yeah i'm I, you're good i'm at a loss i'm happy to to talk one-on-one -on -one. um you know uh but there's the 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 denim stuff is fantastic you know the the fact that you can um double up operations is great right so you can design and then cut the the denim um, you know, anything, anytime you're cutting on the laser, you know, a sturdy material is definitely helpful if you're going to be etching, right? uh, but finer materials are really good to work with. Um, and, uh, I'm a huge fan of, of hacking and upcycling Ikea frames and, uh, like, um, 
thrift store furniture is also, I've seen a lot of really cool projects with people building TV stands and fireplaces out of old dressers, uh, which is, um, you know, I've got a couple sitting in my basement thinking about what I could do with those, right? Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, when James was talking, it just came to mind that uh, if you, one, one thing that I like to do when I'm doing sort of longer projects is thinking modularly. So, you know, I know I can't commit to a long term on it, but if I know that I build the bench, but then at some point I can cut the holes for the lighting later, you know, multiple points of completion uh, is, is a huge sort of relief valve for me in terms of um, the pressure to get everything done. Um, so, it, you know, it can feel done enough for today and not constantly nag that it's not there all the way. Um, yeah. And then, you know, as a maker, that's my biggest enemy is, is feeling the need to, to get it done and, and the, the fight for time. And then I start to rush. And once I start rushing, it's a mess. Yeah. No, those are, those are great points. Um, yeah. And I think, I think we've all probably got good tips to share for everybody, but let's, let's not, Norm is still, is still on here. So let's, let's get Norm in too. If you're around, what have you been up to this week and, and what are you thinking about? Well, <clears throat> I, I really concentrated this week in coming up with a list of complaints about the fabric LED project, which I thought was way too hard for an old guy with fading eyesight and fat fingers. But what it did help me do is find things around the house that uh, I needed, like tweezers to hold the thread and uh, magnifier glasses, which make me feel even older than I already am. Um, so I got the um, I got the LEDs to light up, and then I I um, uh, sewed them in. At which point they no longer lit up, and so then I tried to figure out what was wrong, and I tightened up the connections and I thought, you know, maybe I hadn't, so any of that, then I took the battery out and, and I connected it instead with alligator clips to a, a, a nine volt, which I thought maybe would blow the stuff out, but it didn't, um, and it worked. So, um, and then I quit um, because I just uh, ran out of time, um, or at least time I wanted to spend on this frustrating thing. Um, yeah. So that's what I did. And then I also, uh, tried to learn a little bit uh, in the background about um, circuit Python because I thought that might be useful mm. to, to know for some of the Adafruit stuff. Um, and then um, for integration projects, I want something that I actually want. Um, and, and so there are a couple tools that would combine metal and wood that I might um, do, but I haven't got detailed thoughts about them yet. Yeah, there's. I feel like you've always had really good project ideas for things that you want to make and and the the intersection of metal and wood can be really fantastic projects um especially if you're trying to do some of the softer metals like if you're working with metal and brass like walnut and brass looks fantastic mm -hmm. and brass is a soft metal so it's it's fairly machinable you can sand through it so you can you can make some cool things that that work in that space there's a ton of good, um, there's a few YouTubers like Tamar of three by three custom. She makes a ton of walnut and brass things. There's a, there's a bunch of good examples out there if you're looking for inspiration that way. So there's, there's lots of cool options. Um, yeah, no, that that's exciting. And, and it is, it's a fiddly, you know, the electronics are always going to be sort of like little fiddly bits and we're going to hopefully be we're headed into, after we get through this integration, we're headed into computational wizardry, which is gonna involve circuits and code. And so the circuit Python that you're talking about is totally gonna be a, a feature. Adafruit really leans in hard into their circuit Python. They like, every, every one of the retailers sort of picks a camp and staunchly sets their flag in that ground. And Adafruit has done it with CircuitPython. They think that Python is a very easy to learn language. And so they want people to learn it and they don't mind that you kind of buy their things to make it happen. 
Uh, but you know, they're great and their tutorials are fantastic. And if you're into it, you lean in and like, that's the, the programming that you learn. If you want to be totally open source, you can do the Arduino route. C++ isn't quite as friendly to learn. It's not as, as natural of a language as Python is. Um, but you can, you're talking, if you really get that wrangled, you can, you can buy bare chips and like not need anybody to supply you with anything except directly buying the chips from manufacturers. So there's different reasons to go in different camps. Um, but we're going to start to explore that. And then we'll think a little bit more about how do you integrate things? But luckily I, I would agree with you. This is probably the fiddliest circuits. Textile circuits are probably the hardest ones across the board because breadboards at least like have clean places where you put things, right? It's a little bit, a little bit more straightforward. Um, but you can go way down that rabbit hole. If you feel like learning surface mount soldering, or maybe you'd even like um, baking, you, there's, a, there's a version of electronics where you bake them in an oven and like it does most of the work for you in lining them up and making them fit together. There's some really cool stuff out there for if you want to get get to electronics. Not in the oven you eat in. We have a reflow oven, and I bought a skillet that was never ever going to have pancakes on it because it's got electronics goop on it. But uh, totally, you can bake your electronics and and get them to work that way. It's it's a pretty cool process. Um, so yeah, th there's um, Steve. You got me really thinking, talking about, like reflecting on the aggregate of those projects. Um, thinking about things overall, the choosing, I, I think my one reflection on everybody is you want to choose something today or tomorrow. Don't mm -hmm. like let yourself get to Thursday and still not be sure what you're going to do. Um, especially if you think that you're going to need to order stuff, you want to, you want to, even if it's not your favorite idea forever, pick something by the time we, by the time we're in Wednesday, you should have ordered whatever it is you need to order is is a big takeaway um another one is if you can build any sort of a model early do it if you can build something out of cardboard if you can mock it up if you can like go buy the clock mechanism from a hobby store totally go do that so that you can see what you're really working with and start to make decisions based on that especially the clock like whatever clock center you buy is going to be a big deciding factor in how everything else flows so buying that as soon as you can, so you can make choices that go along with it is really important. Um, the same thing would be true if you're, if you want to do some circuit stuff, right? You're, if you want to build the digital dice, you're going to need to decide pretty early. Are you going to, are you going to be using little tiny LEDs, big ones somewhere in between? Um, and if you want to sort of make a box that looks like it's a dice with a button on one side, how are you going to enclose that? What's it going to look like? Um, and once you have sort of the pieces that you can't change their size and shape, it'll set in motion what you can start to choose for the rest of it. Um, and then are there ways that you can build your prototype? Like for what are the prototyping materials that you can use? How can you do a cheaper, like Lisa has a pretty mission critical piece of wood for your cutting board. And so how, how can you test, like just knowing that you could do it out of, out of pine, uh, two by fours is a big help because that way you can build a test one, run everything on the test one, and you're not at all risking your, your precious one. And if you're, you know, by the end of the week, you've just made that one board and it's sort of loosely in a shape that you don't even like, you've at least run through the process and you've really gotten to see a lot of learning from just one week's worth of work. Um, those, those sorts of strategies headed forward can be really helpful. Um, and don't, don't, try to build a piece of furniture inside of a week, right? Like that, that's going to be something that a professional woodworker would be good at, but none of, none of us fit into that camp. So it's good for us to take our time and go nice and slow and choose, choose the thing you're going to work on. I'm going to also try and get a project on this week. One that I had started a while ago. It's my like giant panel of buttons. I need to put some polyurethane coats on it. I need to paint it. I need to do some code. Um, and get things working. But my hope is that by the end of the week, I'll have a project done. And this is me trying to hold myself accountable to that by sharing with all of you that I want to get that done. I'll post photos of like where it is now and then where we're going, but mine's going to be a, a bunch of things all integrated together. So hopefully I get in tomorrow for a few minutes and just put a couple coats of polyurethane on it so that I can start painting um, after that. But the Getting, getting a project up and running and getting steps 
in is the biggest thing. Getting started is a lot harder than even moving through it. Like once the project that I'm saying I'm going to finish, I've already got started and that gives me a head up. If you're just trying to imagine what you want to do, it's a real mental block to, to be sort of stuck in that early stages, no matter where you're at, no matter how long you've been in quarantine, uh, the like first bit of deciding what do I want to do and how do I get started is, is essential and not to be underestimated. Steven, do you have any good examples of projects that you've been stuck on? I feel like yard uh, projects always got me stuck. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I my projects are usually in, in the ones that are stuck for me are the ones that are stuck because they're too lofty. Um, oh yeah, and I can think of uh, yeah the one that that sort of haunts me when uh, when I think about making stuff is uh, an an outdoor bar countertop mm -hmm. kind of thing. It's going to require learning to you know relearning to weld and improving those skills and you know concrete pouring you know and the, the list just goes on and on and and you know i want to dial it back to the point where i can do it but also you know um, yeah you know that that iterative process so i'm trying to find other little projects along the way to sort of um build those skills up so i can you know it's not just one and, and done and disaster <laughs> no that makes that makes sense Ooh, even just thinking about your concrete because i made i i think you know i've made concrete countertops once for that house that i did all the trim in um i also made a concrete countertop and that that's a whole other discussion for us to have at a different time but just thinking about that i, I think my first step would be to make a slab to make mm -hmm. a concrete slab and then do pay like do brickwork on top of that and then a concrete surface across the top yeah um so that the slab you know like as the ground heaves and haws everything is moving on that slab riding it like a very slow moving boat mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah but th but then you've got little little steps right like thinking about that as an example there's your little your little phased set of a project so if everybody using using your example um setting a concrete pad could be a great first step where you're like it's going to be a lot of work you have to dig, you have to put a little gravel down, you'll build a frame where you're going to pour your cement, um, your concrete, and then you do your concrete slab onto there so that you can actually start to use it as a foundation. And then you'll feel good about that. And then you can set a card table for, you know, outdoor festivities um, where you might want to have a, a long card table and some cups. Those, that is like a good first step. And then you figure out what sort of stones do you want to lay that having those breakpoints is a big is a big win um the robot bartender that i built you know the first tests were just proof of concept things and then i built one that was pretty crappy it had like three drinks that it could make and then i built one that was slightly better and then you know like by the time i have a thing that i, I will not touch for a decade it's going to be like version eight right it's not going to be any of these projects that are big projects that people get really proud of you never ever accomplish them in a week and you never ever do it on the first pass so i think one uh, one thing that, that came to mind a couple minutes ago uh when you're doing mock-ups or when i when i'm doing mock-ups i find it very helpful to uh try to at least be thinking about how i can replicate um and and build on that so if it's right you know like i'm, I'm building an edge to put on a cutting board eventually, but you know, doing it, for example, on that pine mock-up, making sure that the, the file is set up in such a way that you know, I can place it accurately and replicate that without having to fuss with it if it works, right? Whether that's reference points, registration marks, um, you know, cutting, you know, a plywood or a cardboard jig that can be taped down to the board. And then, you know, you're, you're working on, you know, aiming to that, you know, anything that, that I can do to scaffold my next step in this first step always helps me because if it's, if I'm just working on that sort of end result, then it's, it's kind of a constant state of, of reverse engineering to get back to where I was when I moved to the next material or the next step in the project. 
Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I think being deliberate as you move through that is really, really helpful. The projects that I have been a part of that are so focused on the end goal, they always feel like in the end, they become hot glue projects where you're like, oh, damn it. I ju just need this piece to stay together for a little bit. And then there's like hot glue deep inside your very nice thing, right? Like somehow you've got a piece that in the end, it sort of works. It kind of half does the job, but you've made a bunch of sacrifices on your way to get there. Um, so that, that's a great point is to think about how do you make sure that you're making progress and each step gets better as you move forward and you're not making, you're not creating more work by taking shortcuts along the way. That's a, that's a big win. Yeah. Um, cool. There's, there's all sorts of stuff that it takes to be successful. And I feel like I could talk endlessly about these things, but what would be more valuable is just to give you all a chance to ask any questions that you have. If you have like specific things that you've been mulling over while we've been talking, um, but also to stop talking and let you go for it, draw your first sketches, get to get to things, try and imagine what's going on. Um, so I think probably it's worth it for me to say, I'm going to stop and anybody who wants to unmute, cause there's lots of you with your cameras on. And so you might have questions. And so I want to stop and see if anybody's got questions that we can answer. Zoom wait time. This is teaching in 2020 plus. <laughs> All right. It seems like maybe not. So with that, we'll, we should stop. And I hope that you're all going for it with sketchbooks and trying to get things up and running. And if you have any direct questions, feel free to reach out to me this week. Um, I'll be actively monitoring Slack really closely because this is going to be a week where people pop up with things. Um, I'm going to be in on Thursday for sure. I'm going to be in on Sunday for sure. I'm going to be in tomorrow, I think, briefly because I need to get a code of polyurethane on my thing. And I want to be around and helpful if you if you want to pop in the space. I'll probably be in sometime after 5.30, um, but won't stay much longer than 8. So like the 5.30 to 8 window tomorrow. And then on Thursday, I'll be in 5.30 to 8 or 9. And then Sunday afternoon also, just like normal. Um, and then and then maybe, you know, we'll see how it goes. If there's lots of questions that pop up, I can I can probably wiggle in some time on Saturday also. So this is going to be a busy hands-on week. And I think it'll be a flurry of activity when we get towards the end, because that's how deadlines work. And so I look forward to seeing what everybody makes and how we can support everyone in being successful on those endeavors. So with, with that, um, sounds like we're good for tonight and see you everybody. And, uh, you can reach out to me or to Steve if you want to just talk through things or get some help or whatever. All right. See everybody. Stay healthy. Bye, everybody. Bye. Good luck.